Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Saskia Sivanathan and I am the Chief Researcher and Knowledge Translation Officer at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating conversation. So the title of our discussion today is New Dementia Drugs and Therapies, What Canadians Should Know. And I hope you'll be able to walk away after our hour today um, more enlightened about how dementia clinical trials work, what the future of Alzheimer drug um, pipelines are, and what we have to look forward to in broader drug and therapies for dementia. Now, this edition of Dementia Talks Canada is presented by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada in partnership with our wonderful partner, Brain Canada, and you'll find more information about both organizations in your chat. Now, before I jump into welcoming our panelists, I just need, have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. Now, the session is being offered in both English and French. So to select a language, you can just click on the interpretation button that's at the bottom of your screen, and you can choose either language. As well, you'll notice polls that will pop up on your screen throughout the session. Now, this is to help us understand if we're meeting your need and answering your questions. So please do provide your feedback. The session is also being recorded and it will be made available on our website later this week. And lastly, this is a conversation. So please do send your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen and I'll do my best to get them answered. And if we don't have them answered at the end of this hour, our team will follow up via email to provide you that information. So please do make sure you've provided your contact information. Now the Alzheimer's Society of Canada acknowledges that our offices are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashnabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. And given that our work is in the dementia space, we want to highlight some of the fantastic work that Indigenous communities and organizations are doing in dementia. So we'd encourage you to take a look at the Native Women's Association of Canada's Dementia Toolkit and Dementia Storybook, and to make healthcare professionals aware of the Canadian Indigenous Cognitive Assessment. And lastly, we'd encourage you to take a look at any webinars and documents that are available about dementia through the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health. And all of these will be available in the Zoom chat if you are interested in learning more. So it is now my pleasure to introduce the panelists who are joining this conversation today, all of whom are phenomenal experts in the field. So first, let me welcome Dr. Sharon Cohen. She's a behavioral neurologist and medical director of the Toronto Memory Clinic. And Sharon and her team run one of the key sites in Toronto for many of the clinical drug trials related to Alzheimer's. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. And next, I have Dr. Serge Gauthier. He is the Emeritus Professor in Neurology and Psychiatry at McGill. Serge has been involved in drug, dementia drug development across the spectrum, so we're looking forward to the conversation. Welcome, Serge. Merci, Saskia, et bonjour à tout le monde. And last but certainly not least, we've got Dr. Howard Churko. He's a cognitive neurologist at Baycrest Health Sciences Center and professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. And Howard also oversees one of the largest non-pharmaceutical related clinical trials in Canada. Welcome, Howard. Thank you, Saskia. Delighted to be here. Bonjour tout le monde. It's a très grand plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Now, because drug development is such a broad field, I'm going to start with a quick five minute presentation so that we're all starting off of the same page. Uh, and one of the places we're actually going to start with is conflict of interest disclosures, as we at the Alzheimer's Society do feel it's important that you as an audience are informed about any relationships that may um, impact this conversation. 
So could I have the slides up, please? I'm not seeing them yet. So we'll give it a minute for the slides to be able to pull up. Here we go. Thank you. Um, so could I have the next slide, please? Serge, if you don't mind, could you walk us through briefly your disclosures? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have um, an advisory role for uh, the scientific boards of various companies. Some of them are developing uh, diagnostic tests for uh, various types of dementias, including Alzheimer. And some companies are developing medications. And I'm also uh, an editor in chief of a journal called Journal of Prevention of Alzheimer Disease. And I'm a board member of the Toronto based Sharon Francis Foundation. Awesome. Thank you very much, Serge. Next slide, please. Sharon, if I could ask you to please walk us through your disclosures. Yes, of course. So I'm a salaried employee of Toronto Memory Program. I'm very involved in drug development and um, uh, early diagnosis and prevention. Um, and I work with many stakeholders, many biotech and pharmaceutical companies, both in a consulting capacity to help our colleagues in pharma develop the best trial protocols that meet the needs of patients. Um, uh, some of these are advocacy boards, some of them are pharma and biotech. And in addition to my consulting work, I am the principal investigator at Toronto Memory Program for a large number of uh, uh, pharmacologic programs in Alzheimer's disease. So you see many companies listed there. Again, all funds go to my institution, none to me personally. Thanks very much, Sharon. And next slide, please. Thank you, Howard, if I could turn it over to you. First, so um, we run a clinical trials unit at Baycrest and in the last slide, I mentioned I'm a principal investigator, a site investigator on pharma sponsored clinical trials here at Baycrest, which go to fund the research institute and I don't get any personal funding from those. Um, I'm the, uh, in terms of advisory boards and on any pharmaceutical advisory board, we have had a ministerial advisory board on dementia at uh, the federal level, and also a scientific director of CCNA, which I haven't listed here. We, in the past, did have partnerships with pharma, but unfortunately, we haven't had any within the past five years, and I don't receive any other honorary or sit on any uh, speakers' bureaus. Thanks very much, Howard. Um, and next slide. Thanks. These are my disclosures. So I am an employee of the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, and I have an affiliate professorship at McGill. Um, I don't receive any, um, I don't have any financial sponsorships or relationships to disclose, uh, but I, I do serve on the Federal Ministerial Advisory Board on Dementia to the uh, Federal Minister of Health. This is in a volunteer basis, uh, so I get no payment and it is consultation only. So Thank you, everyone, for walking us through that. I'm going to get us um, directly into the, the next slide. Uh, so you will often see uh, the news headlines where there's a new drug that is showing promise in a mouse or rat model, or perhaps another drug that or, or a new um, pathway related to dementia or to Alzheimer's disease uh, that again is showing positive um, effects maybe in cells. And the Alzheimer's Society is often asked to comment on these. Uh, and when I do comment, uh, my tone is usually cautiously optimistic. And hopefully this slide helps you understand why. So a lot of those headlines um, and those uh, positive effects that we're seeing, which we are still hopeful about, tend to be at the stage one or stage two that you're seeing in the funnel, which is the top end of the funnel, sort of still at the drug discovery or preclinical development stage. And so what that means is, is that there's still a long way to go before those compounds can make it down to the clinical development stage, which is stage three. And then after it's gone through all of that rigorous uh, testing through to the regulatory approval and then available to the public. 
So it's, it's, you know, it's about a 2% success rate. And this is generally not necessarily specifically for Alzheimer's or dementia broadly, where that rate is even lower sometimes. Um, so hopefully this helps frame some of the discussion around why it's been so difficult and why there is so much debate and discussion around um, uh, drugs that are coming forward. And if we could go to the next slide, please. We have a panel of experts who can really walk us through in much more detail here how clinical trials work, but I wanted to give people just a very high level overview. Uh, there are generally three phases to a clinical trial. In fact, there's a fourth phase as well. But phase one is, is usually in young, healthy people where you're testing the safety and the dosage of a drug. Phase two is when you're testing that drug or that therapy in people who are impacted by the disease. In this case, it might be Alzheimer's and um, it's in a larger group. And here's where you're actually testing the efficacy or the effectiveness of that drug in patients. And it's often tested against uh, what's called a dummy treatment or a placebo. And sometimes we've been asked the question, well, why does there have to be a placebo? I want, you know, my mom's been diagnosed, she met the criteria and she's in this clinical trial. I want her to get the, the drug. Um, but the nature of clinical trials means that you are testing for the effectiveness of that drug and you have to test it against, well, standard of care and in this case, often a placebo. But again, we have panelists who can talk, talk us through that in more detail. And then the, the, the final, that phase three, which is where we, we generally hear and there's a lot more excitement, is looking at the effect of the drug in a much larger group, up to thousands. And this is happening across clinical sites, often across multiple countries, um, and, uh, and takes a long time. You, if you look at that bar at the bottom, these trials can take up to 10 years or 15 years in development over the whole course of the period. And there's a lot of funding and time and effort that goes into all of it before, and this is after the drug has met all of the criteria after phase three, it goes through to the regulator. So in Canada, this, this slide is reflecting um, um, our partnership and, and understanding from the Alzheimer Research Institute in the UK. But in Canada, the regulators are Health Canada. Um, who will review, again, the safety and effectiveness of the drug before it might get licensed and available to the general public. So if we can get to the next slide, please. So this is the Alzheimer's disease drug development pipeline. And, um, and thank you, Sharon. We were having a discussion earlier. This is specifically to Alzheimer's disease. It is not dementia broadly. As, as many of you know, there's many, many diseases that fall under the dementia umbrella. Um, but this data is looking at Alzheimer's disease specifically and the drug development pipeline. And so as we just discussed in phase three, there are currently 31 agents that are being looked at in 47 trials. Uh, if you take a look at phase two, which is sort of the, that um, we discussed the, the looking at the effect of the drug, but in a much smaller population, you're looking at 82 agents that are currently being assessed um, in 94 trials. Another interesting and important piece to highlight here is that often we think of these trials as all being sponsored by pharmaceutical, um, the pharmaceutical industry and pharmaceutical organizations. And while the majority are, there are a fair number of these trials that are also sponsored by public-private partnerships or by academic medical institutes or centers that also contribute to those sponsorships. And could we go to the next slide, please? So here, what I just want to highlight very briefly is at the bottom left-hand side of that uh, purple square that just pulled up, which is that the different agents, therapies, or drugs that are being um, assessed and that are part of the Alzheimer uh, uh, drug development pipeline are across different classes. So not all of them are necessarily what are called disease modifiers. The vast majority right now, 83%, are disease modification um, agents, which means that they're trying to get at the underlying cause of dementia to be able to slow cognitive decline 
or prevent it altogether. But there are also drugs, and you can see there are about 70% of 7% of them that are looking at assess at dealing with the behavioral and neuropsychological psychiatric symptoms of dementia. And then there are another 10% that are looking at cognitive enhancement. Um, we'll get into a lot more detail on this later on. And if we can go to the last slide here, this is a very busy slide, but the point of this is to just help people understand again that there is a broad range of agents that are being looked at within the Alzheimer drug development pipeline only. And so you might have heard the headlines about aducanumab and lecanumab, which are two drugs that recently completed their phase three trials. And you could see them there right in the middle of the uh, circle in red. And the mechanism of action here for those drugs in the class they fall under is they are addressing amyloid, which is a type of protein that accumulates in the brains of people living with dementia. But you can see that there's a whole host of other colors because there are other mechanisms of actions that are also being targeted and looked at by other drugs. So for example, inflammation, tau, oxidative stress. So there are other classes of drugs that could also potentially make it through this pipeline. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. I'm now going to stop talking and turn it over to our experts here. Uh, let me welcome everyone, and maybe I'll start with my very first question uh, to you, Serge. So I mentioned a bit um, the, the concept of classes of drugs. Uh, sometimes they can be referred to as categories or sets or groups. Could you tell the audience a little bit more about what that means? Indeed. Thank you, Saskia, for the question, which is indeed uh, of interest to the audience at large. Uh, and I thought of an example that everybody will relate to, that is cholesterol-lowering drugs, statins. We hear about them all the time. I take one of them. Many people listening are taking one of them. So that's a good example of a class that is drugs that have a similar mechanism of action against a specific um, a factor in the body, a biological factor that plays a role in uh, higher risk of the heart attack and stroke. So statins is a class. For the field of Alzheimer, it's relatively easy for now because we have already in for prescription use in pharmacies for the past 20 plus years, a group of drugs that are called together cholinesterase inhibitors. So they have in common, that's the old Aricept, uh, Exelon, Galantamine, now with generic names, donepezil, uh, rivastigmin, uh, galantamine, what they do is they increase the amount of acetylcholine in the brain, also in the rest of the body, hence some of the side effects. But it's also a class of drug. And perhaps the public may ask, why is it important? It's because they have common features, but they also have subtle difference. Uh, it's useful to have multiple um, drugs to choose from in a class because one a specific drug may agree better with a specific kind of patient or a particular biologic profile of a patient, or if you have side effects, uh, you have an alternative, alternative drug from that class. So perhaps my final point about that question you raise is it's good to have multiple medications within a class because it gives us more choice for individual patients. Thank you so much, Serge. Sharon, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, maybe I could just piggyback uh, some Absolutely. comments. So in the drug development pipeline from 2022 for Alzheimer's drugs, what you um, showed, Saskia, is in the uh, color coding, uh, particularly in the upper uh, uh, left of the slide, there were 12 different categories of mechanism of action. Uh, that then were reflected in the different colors of the, the little uh, drug names that were scattered through the concentric circles. So these were 12 broad categories, including things like tackling amyloid, tackling tau, another important protein, uh, altering or impacting the immune system. That would be a third one vascular changes in Alzheimer's disease, a fourth one, and so on. If you look at the common Alzheimer's ontology, as it's called, there are 18 different broad ways in which we could intervene in Alzheimer's disease, and the current drug development pipeline targets 12 of these. So that's impressive in and of itself. 
then as Serge was saying, within each class, not all anti-amyloid drugs work the same. Some are antibodies. You mentioned aducanumab, lecanumab. These are antibodies that clear amyloid from the brain. Even within the anti-amyloid antibodies, there are substantial differences. But that to me would be a class, anti-amyloid antibodies, because it's targeting amyloid and working in a particular way. But you could have another class of anti-amyloid drugs that prevent formation of amyloid, for example. So why is this important? The more ways that you can target a complex disease, the better chance you have of success in drug development, because not all of these ways are going to work and not all of the drugs within the same class are identical. So it's important to have multiple options. And then at some point, whichever ones look the most promising might actually work best in an additive or synergistic way. So if you have a drug development pipeline with just a couple of different targets or different mechanisms of action, you know, you're, you're very impoverished. You showed that we have over 140 and actually the 2023 pipeline will soon be published and the numbers keep going up in terms of numbers of targets and uh, classes of drugs. Thank you so much, Sharon. You you beautifully anticipated my question to you, actually. Um, and maybe if I could point, uh, direct my next question to you, Howard. We've talked a bit about the different ways in which these therapies can be delivered, and there are pros and cons to all of them. And you, I, I would love if you could maybe explain a little bit more what these delivery mechanisms are, because of course people have heard about aducanumab and lecanumab because they're they're more recently in the news. But we know that there are other delivery mechanisms. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Of course. Um, so the idea is that when you're giving your treatment, you have to get it into the body, certainly getting it into the blood, and usually to treat a brain disease like Alzheimer's, you have to get it into the brain. So the problem is how to do that. In many cases, things can be delivered as a pill. There's uh, other ways to, there you can chew things so they go in through the, the mouth, the mucosa, uh, it's a way to get avoid the stomach. There are, the immunotherapies are usually given by intravenous injection. And there are some studies in uh, clinical trials now where the injection has to be into the spinal fluid. So the, Drugs will be given by an injection in a lumbar puncture needle every few months into the spinal fluid, which sounds difficult, but it has been done in other, in other illnesses. So it depends on the molecule, the, how it has to be delivered to get to the target. Thanks so much, Howard. Serge, I want to come back to a conversation we had earlier uh, where you talked a bit about the efficacy um, of a drug and, and what that could mean and how that's important um, in the Alzheimer pipeline and, and the broader drug delivery pipeline. Could you could you talk people through that a little bit more, what you mean by efficacy and why that's a consideration? Thank you. It's an important question that was also dear to the heart of uh, Health Canada. Uh, when they reviewed the currently available drugs 20, 25 years ago. And uh, I'm old enough to have been, along with uh, uh, Ken Rockwood and uh, others, uh, we were asked as outside reviewers to comment on the clinical efficacy. So when you do a clinical trial, usually, especially in phase three, you have one main target for efficacy, usually it's memory related, but it could be also behavior in some types of dementia or certain stage of Alzheimer's, or it could be a combination of different measures that you put together as one measure. So for a clinical trial, you get a, a, measure, a number, and it has to be statistically different from the control group, which may be on placebo, or it could be on um, standard of care, other drugs. But then, in real life, in clinical practice, doctors are not going to do that kind of numbers in their office. Uh, so we have to think through when we do the phase three trial designs, and that's one of the things Sharon does very well, is advise companies to think ahead, what, do, what, what will the clinicians do in their office later to translate what we did in clinical trial into clinical practice? And I'll let Sharon uh, perhaps expand a bit on that. How can we translate the numbers we see in a clinical trial where you have a comparator group and you have statistics? 
and then you move into clinical practice and you have only one individual in front of you and no competitor. Sure. Do you want me to tackle that? Sure. Go ahead, Sharon. Okay. So let me let me just uh, back up a little bit and say that there are different ways to assess efficacy within a clinical trial. But really what we're wanting to know is, is the drug doing what we want? The other major uh, factor that needs to be assessed is safety. So we're putting safety aside. Let's say a drug is safe enough. Does it give us the benefit we want? And depending what that benefit is, at what stage of the disease, we may you know, expect a certain degree of improvement compared with the placebo or untreated group. Uh, we may expect a certain slowing of disease. So both the placebo and the active treated group are still declining, but the active treated group are uh, showing a slowed rate of decline. So what that um, uh, number is, as Sir says, or the standard effect size, it's, it's, and what we want it to be. So, you know, when you design a study, you decide ahead what is going to be a success in your study, and then you need to meet that, and you get regulatory and ethics board approval to run the study, not just at the end of the study, so that everybody is on board that if we meet these numbers, this is a positive study. Now, within a study, you know, the, 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 the scales and measures that we put participants through are very different from what we use in clinical practice. <clears throat> and it could be, <clears throat> excuse me, it could be that we need, with a very novel drug, some new scales in clinical practice or new biomarkers or blood tests to measure whether a drug is having an effect in an individual person. Or it might be that clinician tools, the tools that doctors already use are okay to continue using, but we need to um, clarify what the expectation should be. So mm -hmm. with the drugs that Serge mentioned, cholinesterase inhibitors, we're expecting to increase and improve cognition. So you want, let's say, a mini mental state score to go up. If you're looking at a disease slowing drug, then you want that score to stay relatively stable, to decline very little, let's say over six months to a year to a year and a half. So it's a different expectation. And that's what patients and practicing doctors need to understand. And I guess it's ultimately, it comes down also to what's of importance to the patient, right? Because it, the, the scale would also reflect their abilities and their and their functional abilities. And, and that's a question we get quite frequently as well. Um, but sorry, Howard, I see that you have something to add. Please go ahead, jump in. So, Saskia, I'm glad you've asked this question. So I think, what is success? Um, you know, what is the success for a medication? What do patients want? What equals success? And I think we're sitting here, at least I'm sitting here in Toronto, and it's good to look back a hundred years, a hundred years ago in, in, uh, in Ohio and in Toronto, two medications were used, which were both successes. One was insulin. A uh, hundred years ago this month, Dr. Banding went through the ward at Toronto General with a whole ward of people in diabetic coma, gave insulin to each of them, and they all woke up. And it was instant success. And you know, uh, in Akron, Ohio, they gave, started giving iodine to people with goiters who had low thyroid, they all went away. And so the condition was, was cured. That's a home run in medicine. That is the success that patients want. They want their Alzheimer's to be cured and treated and go away. And I think that's, that's right to have that as a goal. So it's important for our audience to understand that we are nowhere near that level of success with Alzheimer's disease. We would like to be. We unfortunately don't, haven't found the one chemical that if we replace it in the brain, it'll stop the illness. Or if we, one chemical, if we give it, the, all the pathology will go away. The memory loss will go back to normal. So when we're talking about success in clinical trials, we're talking about small amounts of success. You know, in baseball, we talk about we're trying to hit a, a, a ball to get us to first base rather than a home run. And this is frustrating for the, the patients and their families because they want a home run now and that's understandable. So as we talk about statistical changes in mini mental and measures to show some mild slowing of progression, this is progress, but it, it is 
incremental and frustratingly slow for patients, but that is where the field is right now. Thank you, Howard. Um, and, and a good point, actually. I'd, I'd love to be able to come back and I'd post the question to Serge and, and Sharon, but Howard, please jump in as well. What are some of the factors that get considered when a drug is going through the regulatory process? Because this is another concern um, and uh, one of the questions we get quite a bit from patients. What we, if, if it were Health Canada and, and they're looking at approving a drug to come to the market, what are the factors that get considered in this? Maybe I'll give it a shot because I'm the oldest and I, I, I did live the experience of uh, going through the approval of uh, cholinesterase inhibitors. In those days, um, the um, Health Canada specifically um, was getting the results of phase threes. They were not involved in planning the, the design of phase two and three as perhaps they are now. Um, what they were most concerned about is um, going beyond the statistical difference in the one measure that was uh, assumed to be the most important, but also other measures of uh, ability to do things, functional change, um, global impression of change. They had to be convergence. So as far as the symptomatic drugs, the regulators were looking at um, improvement in multiple domains, um, not always the same size, but always the same direction. So that's what I can say from what the regulators are looking at. There maybe have been a change over the past uh, 20 years uh, with um, federal authorities, especially in the US, uh, being asked through the process of phase two, phase three, phase four. And maybe uh, Sharon or Howard uh, has more recent knowledge about the process. Sharon, yeah, please go ahead. Maybe I could just say that um, the process of, of um, drug approvals by Health Canada is a complicated one. There are many avenues uh, that Health Canada can take in terms of reviewing a dossier and granting or denying licensing. Uh, and uh, it depends on the nature of the compound being submitted uh, and the nature of the data. And, uh, you know, it's usually a lengthy process. It can take up to a year for Health Canada to grant an approval or to say no. That's a long time after, as you've pointed out, Saskia, drug development in clinical trials phase one, two, and three could take 20 years, and then you're waiting another year, even if you have very positive, as Serge mentioned, perhaps very consistent phase three data. So usually it's a phase three dossier that is then submitted in its entirety to Health Canada. So this is, you know, hundreds of pages of data um, and Health Canada will review this. Now in Alzheimer's disease specifically, now that we've entered this era of disease modifying or disease slowing trials, Health Canada is still, in my view, trying to understand how to gauge uh, um, clinical meaningfulness, if you will, how much slowing is relevant. And they get a little bit hung up on that. You could have very statistically significant results. Um, they do look at consistency because Health Canada, just like a practicing doctor, doesn't want these head scratching situations where cognition's going up, but the patient's doing worse functionally, or there's lots of behavioral problems, even though the MMSC went up. You know, you, you want consistency across multiple scales. Uh, and then you decide whether, you know, you, the trial has met its endpoints adequately. And you can grant approval as a Health Canada regulator or conditional approval and require additional um, uh, things to be met before full approval. I think even in the days of symptom treatment with cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine, there were a lot of missteps and flaws. We never got full approval for memantine. That was a real misstep on the part of Health Canada. And now the trials have become so complicated, these disease modifying trials, that you know, let's hope Health Canada gets it right. They do have an iterative process where they, they will reach back to a pharma company and say, uh, can you explain this? Can you justify that? So there's an opportunity for the uh, companies submitting the dossier then to interact and 
provide clarity. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity for experts that Health Canada may reach out to to weigh in. So yes. there are some checks and balances, but but let's see if this works to our patients' advantage. Thanks, Sharon. And I think also to highlight that there is a process for patients' input as well, and the Alzheimer's Society supported that through the CADIF um, process as well. So certainly there are more and more avenues through some of where where these um, additional uh, pieces are considered. Howard, yes, certainly, please go ahead. And can I pose a question as well? Maybe you can add on to it. We're talking quite a bit about um, drug development and drug, you know, clinical trials related to drugs. But of course, I'd love for the audience to learn a little bit more about clinical trials being used for therapies that aren't necessarily pharmacological. So if you wouldn't mind introducing that as well, that would be great. Pleasure. So first of all, on the just a little note on the Health Canada the the process, the, the, a funny process in Canada, it's much more, less open to the public, less transparent, as in many things in government in Canada, if you compare with the states, it's more of a black box. They're making decisions. The Health Canada may reach out to experts. Often in the past, they reach out to Dr. Gauthier in this area. So it's a, a, a loss that he, he claims he's retired. I guess maybe they'll still reach out to him. Um, but as a, the scientific community, I've approached them about Aducan and I'm saying, we would like to rep make representation as a community, all the experts together and have a dialogue about things. They don't really want a dialogue. They want to control the process. And, and quite honestly, many times, I don't think we know the elements that go into the decision. For example, I think what, what your people in the audience are asking is, what about price? Does price come into a consideration with Health Canada? I don't think so. Um, I don't think it ever has in the past, but uh, what about questions about what approval will mean for use of health resources or health economy in Canada? I don't think they make that consideration either. They look at efficacy, they look at safety, and that's really the limit of what they're looking at. So that's different from each province deciding whether that province will put a new medication on their formulary. So you know, that's, a, that's a second yeah. very different stage in the process. You should know that in addition to the, the medications pharmaceutical companies are developing, there are other non-pharmaceutical approaches being tried. And, and in our own laboratory, we're working with neuromodulation, electrical brain stimulation, which may be a symptomatic treatment. And there are all sorts of things being tried in clinical trials with various levels of success. And in addition, we mustn't forget lifestyle interventions within CCNA. We're working on uh, dementia prevention at the, the mild cognitive impairment stage using aggressive exercise and diet and other lifestyle interventions as forms of therapy. So the future, maybe there'll be lifestyle plus pharmaceutical agents, at least in the prevention area. So there's a lot of work going on in drugs and in non-drug approaches. Thanks, Howard. I mean, and I think to Sharon's point, right, our hope is that eventually we'll get to the point of having a cocktail and multiple options for patients. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, the, that's the whole point. But could you maybe help us understand, how do you apply, how do you have a clinical trial for lifestyle? How does that even work? So, yeah, it's hard. And this is why you have to have um, a lot of people studied for a long time. And prevention is, is the area where we think that lifestyles may have the biggest impact. Is There are a number of big studies. The most successful was a quite famous study called FINGER with, uh, run by Mia Kivipelto in Sweden and, and Denmark, where they looked at uh, thousands of people and intervened with a program to increase exercise and control of blood pressure and decreasing dementia risk factors. And they did show even after two years uh, uh, an impact. And uh, we are running, setting up such trials across Canada in our CCNA prevention uh, program. So it takes many scientists working together. There are, but there are big lifestyle trials in the US, something called US Pointer, uh, Can Thumbs Up, our CCNA, our Canadian study where what, but the thing is you can't really have a placebo the same way, right? You can't, you can't tell people you're in the control group don't do anything to improve your lifestyle. So a control group would have to be giving people education about what they can do to reduce their risk factors, comparing that to, for example, giving everyone a trainer or giving them other forms of motivation. Because the problem with lifestyles, of course, in many ways it's easier to take a pill than to change your diet or 
change your exercise program. So part of the lifestyle approach has to be, how do we make people know what they should be doing? How do we motivate people to change their lifestyle? A very big, very difficult question. Thanks, Howard. Yeah, and certainly one that we're all interested in and some of the pieces we've known for a while, but how to implement those lifestyle changes. A another question I'd like to pose to all of you and, 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 and please do jump in for whoever might feel uh, you can. There's a lot of interest in getting involved in clinical trials, whether it's drug development trials or whether it is um, lifestyle or other trials or cohorts. But of course, you have very rigorous inclusion and exclusion criteria for all of these. So if you could maybe explain, um, and maybe Sharon, I'll start with you, for some of the Alzheimer's disease um, uh, trials, drug trials that are currently underway, what are some of the criteria for the inclusion and exclusion criteria? And then what can people do if they don't meet the inclusion criteria? Sure. So um, Saskia, it depends really what stage of development we're talking about. So in phase one, when we don't know the safety, let's say first in human, and, and sometimes phase one is first in Alzheimer's, we are conducting phase one studies, very exciting studies in people with the disease, not just healthy controls. But here, because we don't have enough safety data, you're going to be very careful to include to exclude people who have a host of other medical conditions and other medicines that might put them at risk of harm in a study. Uh, and you might be trying in phase one and phase two to do what we call proof of concept to really illustrate that a certain drug acts in a certain way. And so you want to optimize the chance of that by having a very narrow uh, selection of patients within the entire Alzheimer's community. As you get into phase three, your numbers go up. We're talking about trials in the hundreds, if not thousands of participants around the world. You're thinking if this drug is successful, You've already got safety data in phase two, you'll get more in phase three, but you're really looking at efficacy. Does the drug give us the benefit we want? And if so, what will the market be? Will it be limited to the inclusion and exclusion criteria in our phase three trial? And can we go broader? Can we allow more people with a you know, broader range of cognitive test scores, with broader range of background medications and uh, uh, other diseases, heart disease, diabetes, real people to be in the, in the trial so that if the drug is successful, then we've shown that this actually works in a population that's not too different from the real world. Mm. There's usually a happy medium or not so happy medium, but you know we, we still have a somewhat artificial group. People who are in clinical trials tend to be more educated. They tend to be healthier on fewer background medicines than their counterparts who are not in trials. And so there's always going to be a little bit of disconnect. And that's part of what a phase four study is about, to broaden the population and give other people an opportunity. Right now, most of the drugs in the drug development pipeline are focusing early in early stages of the disease, the mild cognitive impairment mm -hmm. stage or the mild dementia stage and not so much for moderate or severe dementia. Those people are not completely excluded, but there are fewer trials for them. And happily, there are some prevention trials way at the other end in people who are still cognitively normal, but at risk for Alzheimer's. And most of these trials, but not all, will require people in the screening for the trial to have amyloid in the brain. And that's something very different in the last few years that we need to confirm that this person is actually on that Alzheimer's pathway. Otherwise, an anti-amyloid drug has nothing to act on if there's no amyloid in the brain. And we didn't used to do that. That's part of the reason for many failures in the past. So you can see the criteria shift. And then there are a whole host of other things, you know, how old you are and uh, uh, do you have a study partner who can come and join you? And, and so there are lots of reasons why people may not be eligible for a trial, which is very, very disappointing. Thank you, Sharon. And, and Sarah Jane Howard, anything that you can add, particularly for people who maybe don't meet that eligibility criteria? Sarah, yeah, please go ahead. Before I talk about people who don't meet the criteria, I'll just say one piece of good news is that um, for Alzheimer's trials, um, 
there are new criteria. You have to have amyloid in your brain, perhaps some degree of tau pathology in the brain, and a bit of brain uh, atrophy. Um, so this used to require a head scan and often a lumbar puncture, and uh, maybe half of the people are found not to be suitable because they lack one of the criteria. Uh, my good news is that um, we're close to have blood tests that uh, can reflect what's going on in the brain. Mm. And uh, if you have this abnormal blood test, you're very likely to have successful um, second test, uh, like a PET scan or a lumbar puncture, and then you can go into the clinical trial. So there's a bit of good news in um, the field in the sense that um, when you screen uh, a thousand people to join a study for Alzheimer, um, we'll be able to pre-screen with a blood test many of these people. So only the ones who are most likely to be suitable for the study will get in. Now, the other point, I'll just finish with that, Howard. Um, what about people who are not able to join a specific uh, drug trial? Well, there are others, um, and, and this is a, a role important for the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, is to have a website always uh, up to date about non-pharmacologic interventions. And I'll make a plea, and if we have time, I'll come back to why it's so important for observational studies. We've learned a lot over the past 20 years, Howard and I, uh, um, from people who had stroke mixed in with Alzheimer. Remember, Howard, you were still in training? No, you were already a young staff. <laughs> <laughs> Howard and I, we go back a long way. <laughs> so, yes, of course. Uh, so observation is important. It's something Canadians do very well. Study. Yes, yes. you're not getting a new treatment, but you agree to see the doctor and its team um, every year and get an, an, an extra test like a PET scan or lumbar puncture. And we've learned so much from that. It's something we do well in Canada. We'll come back to that if there is time. Thank Howard? you, Serge. Howard, I'll close with you on that question, if you don't mind. And then uh, we have a whole host of questions from uh, people who've joined us that I'd love to be able to take. I just wanted to reinforce what Sharon said that Get, you know, people are enthusiastic to get into clinical research and they have to be prepared that there may be disappointments. There are multiple hurdles to get you into any particular clinical trial. And some are clear from the outside. If you have a pacemaker, almost all the clinical trials now, you have to get an MRI scan. Pacemakers, you can't go in the MRI. You'll never, it's very hard to get into a clinical trial. But there are things you know, have to be in a certain memory range. Some of them want a particular, you know, the amyloid scan, certain genetic uh, uh, makeup. So you have to be prepared for the fact that even though you want to get into a clinical trial, it, it may not work. And, you know, we, in our electrical stimulation, the good thing is we can take people who fail to get into clinical trials, but you have to be geared, they're prepared that there may be frustration in getting into one clinical trial, but maybe the next one you'll qualify. And that's my message. Thanks for that, Howard. And and um, just to also emphasize um, all of your points, we do have a research portal uh, where we have information not just about clinical trials, but also observational studies and other research that you can absolutely get involved in. Uh, so please do visit that. And I know the team has been posting other links as well, including uh, to the Toronto Memory Clinic, CCNA, uh, where you can find out more information about different studies you can get involved in. Now, I'm going to take a couple of questions that have come in through the Q&A, and there are more, but we might not be able to get to them. But one of the questions uh, is that sometimes there have been treatments that have been approved by Health Canada, but the provinces don't always um, approve that drug on their formulary list. So what the, this question is, how likely is that how likely is it that provinces might adopt some of the drug trials or, or some of the, the dementia drugs or maybe not even specifically dementia drugs, but generally, how is that decision made in, in terms of when a province might decide to approve it and make it um, available to their populations? Howard, you had your hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I was in Quebec for many years and now I'm in Ontario. And even, it, this is a very difficult area. It's very, there are Alzheimer's drugs approved in Quebec that aren't approved in Ontario, like the river stigmine patch. Is there any scientific reason? No, it's purely a, 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 you know, patients are not different in Ontario than Quebec. So why would this be approved and used in Quebec? And not? It's purely financial, a decision of the Ministry of Health. And this is one area that, that patients and families and 
experts such as ourselves have to try and get involved that, that the decisions should be made for scientific reason and because of need, there should be no re reason that the, a drug is approved in one province and not another. And this is something I think that as a group nationally, we all have to work together to prevent either the, the drug is worth approving or it's not. Now there are considerations such as financial, but, but one would think that these, these would not distinguish one province from another and, and they do. So just to just to clarify there, Howard, basically you're what we're saying is, is that the drug is approved for distribution across Canada, but it just is not necessarily covered through the financial drug plan, financially through the uh, the provincial drug plans, correct? Exactly. Okay. So Health Canada, Saskia, just to clarify, Health Canada licenses the drug, gives it approval. And then other organizations, it used to be the Common uh, Drug Review Board, now it's CADF, will review the drug approval, the drug, and make recommendations about whether a drug or a technology should be cost covered. They'll make those recommendations to the provinces, and it's up to individual provinces and territories to then decide on their own. And one really has to ask where the expertise is to deny uh, a drug that Health Canada has said is safe and effective, particularly when you're talking about a serious unmet need in Alzheimer's, for one province to say we'll cover the cost for seniors and for another to say we won't, it is, is really healthcare inequality across the country where we like to think that we have socialized medicine that applies to all. Thanks. And I'd like to make one last comment. Sure. On, on Go ahead. Stuff. I've got more questions for you. We are at CCNA. We, we've asked to form a committee nationally to look at and establish national criteria for, for licensing and adoption of disease modifying drugs for Alzheimer's in Canada because there is no gold standard or no, uh, there's no document that Health Canada or OHIP or RAMQ in Quebec can look to to say this meet. This is where the bar is. So we would like to have some national bar to, to, to be established. Thanks for that, Howard. Um, I have another question, which uh, is uh, non-pharma related, but the question is around electrical stimulation, which I think you touched on briefly, uh, Howard. How does that work? Is it a safe procedure? Uh, and uh, people would like to know a little bit more about it. This is a whole other Topic, but you know, in, in a two-minute answer that you could summarize, Howard. <laughs> second answer, it, it kickstarts some of the neurons in the brain to make some of the systems work better, and it it's not magic. It doesn't stop Alzheimer's disease, but we've seen improvement of symptoms even more than putting people on cholinesterase inhibitors. So we're in the midst of phase two clinical trials funded by the NIH now because this is. But there are exciting things that may come to, to pass using electricity. So the brain is electric, so stay tuned. There are possible treatments to come. Thank you. Perhaps we what should is... specify, uh, just to be clear, because there was a lot of publicity a week ago for Parkinson about uh, needles in the brain. But that's not the case here. We're talking about Bruce's wires on the scalp, isn't it, Howard? Yes, so that's very important. We're not sticking needles inside the brain. We're just basically putting it on a, a, a sponge on top of the scalp so it's not, yeah. not dangerous. Very important about the type of delivery, for yeah. sure. Uh, thank you, everyone. We're coming to the end of our panel, but I have a, a last question that I do want to ask um, each of you. Uh, what are you most excited about when you are thinking about the future of um, dementia, the both drug and broader therapies for Alzheimer's and dementia? Um, could you tell us a bit more? Maybe I'll I'll start with Howard and and move to to each of you. Howard, what are you most excited about? So what I'm excited about is within the CCNA and, and, and Canadian researchers, we put together a big cohort of uh, over a thousand people with Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairment. We're going to learn is Alzheimer's are there subgroups within Alzheimer's disease? Maybe a subgroup can be defined where there's inflammation and they'll respond to anti-inflammatory. So using the new breakthroughs and diagnosis that Dr. Gauthier mentioned and uh, our new knowledge of mechanisms and imaging, we may be able to get past the, 
the stage to find that there are important subgroups that can be treated differently. Thank you, Howard. Serge, how about you? What are you most excited about? I'm excited about the parallel work um, for prevention. Uh, eventually, there will be specific interventions for the higher risk group to be defined. And then people with MCI, mild dementia, they'll have their own set of treatments based on their biologic profile. And people with moderate uh, dementia, we still need to improve their quality of care. And um, I think in, the, in Canada, we've achieved this critical mass of uh, people interested. And uh, there's young people coming to replace us. Uh, Howard, you'll be glad to know. Uh, the students are excited about the field, yes. And um, we need people from different disciplines to join. Um, it's a bit um, like oncology 20 years ago. There's a excitement. There'll be a personalized medicine approach. Uh, we're gonna make a difference. Thank you, Serge. And Sharon, last but certainly not least, what are you most excited about? This is an exciting time in Alzheimer's disease drug development. We are able to diagnose the disease early and accurately, uh, although we are not uh, funding that initiative and our healthcare landscape isn't set up to do that in clinical practice. We are certainly doing that within clinical trials. So people don't have to wonder if maybe they probably have Alzheimer's, they have it or they don't. The uh, lessons from the last couple of decades and particularly the last decade in clinical trials is yielding results now and we have uh, the potential in Canada this time next year to have a disease modifying drug on the market that will be a first that will focus attention on not missing the diagnosis early on we don't want people to lose the opportunity uh, to have treatment to slow the disease to maintain their quality of life and their independence for a longer period of time that's very exciting. We haven't had that. You know, the last drug approved was, uh, was it Memantine in 2004 or something like that? It's been a long time, 20 years. And to think that we're on the cusp of a new era of disease modifying treatments. And with the first in class, then you'll get better in class and best in class. That's how it works in all therapeutic areas. You don't expect the first drug to be, you know, sort of, a, well, as Howard said earlier, this is not a cure. But these steps are very important. You need a foothold and then you can build combination therapies and, and really get somewhere. So if we look at what's happened in HIV or heart disease or so many other therapeutic areas, we've been behind. The brain's been very complicated to interrogate and now we are seeing results. Uh, so I think we can look forward to disease modifying therapies added to uh, patient options in Canada. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. A special thank you to the panelists from myself, from the Alzheimer's Society, and the whole team who's been working behind the scenes to, to bring this panel together. Uh, we appreciate all of your expertise here today and the time that you've given us. Thank you to the audience who joined us. We may not have answered all of your questions, but rest assured, we will be following up with it. And a reminder that this, this um, uh, webinar has been recorded and will be available shortly on our website. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Askia.